<laughs> okay. There were a couple of dozen people scattered around the pews and staring into space, all of them old, and I walked past them looking for a confession box with a light on. When I found one, I stepped inside, closing the door behind me, and waited in the darkness for the grill to slide open. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned, I said quietly when it did, a gust of body odour rushing towards me with such force that I reared back and hit my head against the wall. It has been three weeks since my last confession. What age are you, son? asked the voice from the other side, which sounded quite elderly. Fourteen, I said. I'll be fifteen next month. Fourteen-year-old boys need to go to confession more than once every three weeks, he said. I know what you lads are like, up to no good every minute of the day. Will you promise me you'll go more often in the future? I will, father. Good lad. Now, what sins do you have to confess to the Lord? I swallowed hard. I had been going to confession fairly regularly since my first communion seven years earlier, but not once had I ever told the truth. Like everyone else, I simply made up a collection of ordinary, decent sins and rattled them off with little thought before accepting the obligatory penance of ten Hail Marys and in Our Father. Today, however, I had promised myself that I would be honest. I would confess everything, and if God was on my side, if God really existed and forgave people who were truly contrite, then he would recognise my guilt and set Julian free without any further harm. Father, over the last month I have stolen sweets from a local shop on six occasions. Holy God, said the priest, appalled. Why did you do that? Because I like sweets, I said, and I can't afford them. Oh, there's some logic to that, I suppose. But tell me, how did you do it? There's an old woman who works behind the counter, and all she does is sit there all day reading the newspaper. It's easy to take things without her noticing. Oh, that's a terrible sin, said the priest. You know that's probably that good woman's livelihood. I do, Father. Will you promise me never to do such a thing again? I will, Father. All right then, good lad. Anything else? Yes, Father. I said there's a priest in our school who I don't like very much, and in my head I call him the prick. The what? The prick. And what in God's name does that mean? Do you not know, Father? I asked. If I knew what I'd be asking you. It's another word for a, you know, for a thing. A thing? What do you mean a thing? What class of a thing? A thing, Father, I said. I don't know what you're talking about. I leaned in and whispered through the grill. A penis, Father. Holy God, he repeated. Did I hear you right? If you thought I said a penis, then yes, you did, Father. Well, that is what I thought you said. But why in God's name would you call a priest in your school a penis? How could he possibly be a penis? A man can't be a penis. He can only be a man. This makes no sense to me at all. I'm sorry, Father. That's why I'm confessing it. Well, whatever it is, just stop doing it. Call him by his proper name and show him a bit of respect. I'm sure he treats all the lads in your school very well. He doesn't, Father. He's vicious and he's always beating us up. Last year, we put a boy in the hospital for sneezing too loud. I don't care. You'll call him by his proper name or there'll be no forgiveness. Do you understand me? Yes, Father. Right then. I'm almost afraid to ask, but is there anything else? There is, Father. Go on so, I'll hold on to my chair. It's a bit delicate, Father, I said. That's what the confessional is for, son. Don't worry, you're not talking to me. You're talking to God. He sees everything and he hears everything. You can have no secrets from God. Do I have to say it then, Father? I asked. Will you not just know anyway? Oh, he will, but he likes you to say it out loud, just for clarification purposes. I took a deep breath. This had been a long time coming, but here it was at last. I think I'm a bit funny, Father, I told him. The other boys in my class are always talking about girls, but I never think about girls at all. I just think about boys, and I think about doing all sorts of dirty stuff to them, like taking their clothes off and kissing them all over, and playing with their things. And there's this one boy, he's my best friend, and he sleeps in the bed next to mine, and I can't stop thinking about him all the time. And sometimes when he's asleep, I pull my pyjamas down, and I have a right go at myself, and I create an unholy mess in the bed. And even after I do it, and I think I might be able to go to sleep, I start thinking about other lads and all the things I want to do to them. And do you know what a blowjob is, Father? Because I started writing stories about lads I like, and particularly about... There was an almighty crashing sound from opposite me, and I looked up, startled. The shadow of the priest in the darkness had vanished, and in its place a beam of light was streaming in from above. Is that you, God? I asked, looking up towards its source. From outside the confessional I heard shouts, and I opened the door to peep outside. The priest had fallen out of his box and was lying on the floor clutching his chest. He must have been at least 80 years old, and the parishioners were leaning over him, crying out for help as his face turned blue. 
I looked down at him, my mouth open in bewilderment, and he slowly raised a gnarly finger and pointed it at me. His lips parted and I could see how yellow his teeth were. Am I forgiven, father? I asked, leaning over him. Are my sins forgiven? His eyes rolled in his head. His entire body gave one great convulsion. He let out a roar and that was it. He was gone. God bless us, father's dead, said an elderly man who had been kneeling on the floor supporting the priest's head. Do you think he forgave me? I asked. Before he croaked, I mean. Oh, he did, I'm sure of it, said the man, taking my hand now and letting the priest's head fall rather hard against the marble floor, a tinny sound echoing around the church. And he'd be happy to know that his last act on this earth was to spread God's forgiveness. Thank you, I said, feeling cheered by this. I left the church as the ambulance men made their way inside. It was an unusually sunny day, and truth be told, I did feel absolved, even if I knew that the feelings I'd hidden inside myself wouldn't be going away any time soon. The next morning I awoke to the news that Julian had been found. A group of special branch officers had followed leads that led them to a farmhouse in Cavan, and he was discovered locked in a bathroom while his three captors slept outside. One was killed and the other two were under arrest. Missing a toe, a thumb and an ear, the rest of him was still intact and he had been taken to hospital to begin his recovery. Now, had I been a person of more religious scruple, I might have believed that God had answered my prayers. But the fact was, before going to sleep that night, I'd already committed a few more sins. So instead I put it down to good detective work on the part of Angarda Shakona. It seemed like the most convenient explanation to me.